Hello, and welcome to Waterfront Alliance's first Climate Week webinar entitled Building for Climate Resilience, Understanding the Wedge Guidelines for Coastal Development. Our panelists today will, will be exploring concepts related to building and planning for cl climate resilience into coastal development. My name is Farhana Husseini, and I am the Director of Programs and Climate Initiatives at Waterfront Alliance. For Climate Week, the Waterfront Alliance will be centering critical climate resilience issues facing New York City through a series of webinars like this one, roundtable discussions, art exhibits, boat tours, and coastal cleanups. We welcome you to visit our website to learn more about our events this week. On the next slide, we will learn more about Waterfront Alliance. The Waterfront Alliance began as a project of the Municipal Art Society of New York. It became an independent organization in 20, 2007 when a group of leading activists, businesses, foundations, and civic organizations came together with the goal of making the New York and New Jersey Harbor a shared, resilient, and accessible resource for all. Since then, the Waterfront Alliance has grown into a coalition of more than 1,100 organizations working together to bring about real change to our region's waterways and 700 miles of shoreline. In 2019, the Waterfront Alliance stepped into a new and critical leadership role to define New York Harbor's response to sea level rise and coastal storms. Our crucial long-term focus on increasing waterfront accessibility for all, along with our efforts to advocate for a working waterfront that is a vital source of business activity and well-paying jobs and educating the next generation of waterfront stewards, continue as essential pillars of our work to create a well-adapted and resilient New York Harbor. And on the next slide, we then see a vision of what success looks like. This is Brooklyn Bridge Park. This image paints a picture of what a resilient, ecological, and accessible design through wedge or the waterfront edge design guidelines can do for a community. There is so much going on in this one photo. We have direct access to the water. We have kayakers and the beach, which are then protected from waves and currents. You have resilient infrastructure built into the design and habitat space. And you can't see it in the image, but there are tide pools that are built into the riprap. In discussions we've had with Brooklyn Bridge Park, they've made it clear that they can handle any coastal storm better than any other New York City parks because they have built into the design. You have, a, you have docking infrastructure uh, on the piers. That 514 ship is docked at the park. And we've recently had a historic tall ship from Norway birthed there. And all of this happens in the context of an industrial waterfront. That is Brooklyn Port Authority Marine Terminal in the background, an active port and container facility. Not every waterfront site needs to look like this. And not every community would value the, these specific features but this shows the, robust, the robustness that a waterfront site can have in an urban space. This facility is wedge verified, but I wanna make the point that wedge doesn't dictate this exact outcome. Wedge provides a set of objective and consistent standards that encourage a broad range of design strategies to enhance resilience, ecology, and access, but doesn't prescribe any. In the next slide, we learn more about Wedge. Wedge at its heart is a rating system. You're probably familiar with the LEED standard uh, for buildings or maybe even Envision. Wedge is a peer to those, uh, but one that focuses on the unique aspects of working on the waterfront. Wedge is a points-based points system and there are 250 possible points in the new version of Wedge. Uh, and any project earning more than 130 points earns wedge verification. Uh, 
you earn points based on the design features of your site uh, and the expected performance of those features. As you can see, there are six categories in Wedge that touch on various elements of resilience, ecology, and access. Uh, we look to how uh, projects reduce coastal risk, how they engage communities, and how they protect habitat, and how they structure their shoreline. There are a total of 37 credits in Wedge that measure more than 100 individual performance criteria that we assess for each site. On the next slide, uh, we learn more about the verified projects. There are 12 Wedge verified sites across the country, most of which are in New York City because of the original version of Wedge, which was geared specifically to New York Harbor. But now they include sites in Wilmington, in Miami, and another 11 in multiple states that are in the pipeline currently. Here in New York, you're certainly going to be familiar with uh, sites such as Domino Sugar, uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Eastside Coastal Resilience, and Hunters Point South. Um, you may be less familiar with some of our industrial sites, uh, Sims Recycling and Oak Point uh, McKinnis Cement, for example, Bronx Point, an affordable housing development, or Starlight Park in the Bronx. Um, these are all great places to visit, even the industrial ones. Wedge works with any type of site, uh, except for single family homes. Um, some of the ones in the pipeline include mixed use and market rate development, uh, as well as multiple offshore wind faci port facilities. Um, and in the next slide, uh, we learn more about the Wedge Professionals course. Through, Wedge Professional, through the Wedge Professionals course, we've trained more than 500 people on resilient, ecological, and accessible design. Uh, you can access the course at www.wedgeprofessionals.org. Um, it's a great way to become familiar with the standards uh, and, how to and, how to, and how to learn how it was applied uh, by the design teams at sites like Bronx Point, Oak Point, McKinnis Cement, and Domino Sugar. Um, you get to hear in-depth case studies and learn the ins and outs of great waterfront design. And with that, and without further ado, I will uh, I will transition to our three speakers. Um, Joseph, thank you, Joseph Sakawi, Sakawi, our Waterfront Alliance's Chief Waterfront Design Officer, leads wedge standards as well as design work that Waterfront Alliance is undertaking in Flushing Meadow Corona's Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Um, Mike Porto is Invenergy's external engagement director, where he leads, where he supports their efforts to develop the leading light wind offshore wind installation. Mike also happens to be one of the original authors of Wedge, and so we're very excited to have him here today. Kenneth Hooper, senior project manager of Langan Engineering and Environmental Services, is one of the many field experts that Waterfront Alliance has called upon for technical guidance on the Wedge standards. He is one of the region's great experts on waterfront engineering, and we are really excited to hear from him and hear all about his perspectives. And with that, we can start with our first question. Uh, this question will be for everyone, but Mike, maybe we can start with you. Uh, tell us more about your role and its connection to climate resilience. How often does resilience and adaptation come into your day-to-day -day work? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Rohana. Thanks so much, Joseph and, and the Waterfront Alliance. I, I really, you know, it's nice to come home, if you will. I really love all the work you are all doing and, um, you know, happy to collaborate as, as we are in various sort of ways. Um, as you mentioned, yeah, so I, I run external affairs for Invenergy's Leading Light Wind Project. Invenergy is the largest clean energy developer uh, in the States. You know, we're American based, we're on four continents. We're building over 30 gigawatts of clean energy and we do that in a responsible way and take pride in sort of uh, our, our record of over 200 projects 
uh, and I see Wedge as a, as a tool we can use uh, in building our offshore wind project. Uh, a little bit about our offshore wind project, Leading Light Wind, it's over two gigawatts. We're in the New York Bight. We're way off the coast. You would not see it. We're backed by unions. And so we have this exciting story, and, and Wedge is really a part of that. We've committed to using Wedge in the various facilities that we're looking to build uh, over time. And then, you know, just to answer your question, of course, we, we resiliency and adaptation come up a lot. We try to uh, talk about why we're we're on the mitigation side. So I've moved a little bit more to the other side of the uh, the ledger, I guess, if you will, on the mitigation side. I worked at Con Edison doing stakeholder engagement communications work, specifically on our clean energy commitment. So I'm a, a bit removed from the adaptation side, but in our everyday, as we're talking to stakeholders, we are uh, explaining and and dare I say, you hope it's not needed because it's just absolutely uh, we're inundated every day with all the extreme weather that's happening through climate change and there's there's a lot of work to do, but it it does come up um, and we try to sort of justify why we're building these projects because of the work that needs to be done. And, you know, for anyone that says that what we do in New York doesn't matter, you know, the entire world is watching what New York does. And so we have a lot of work to do. And so we are um, mission driven and really trying to sort of make sure that we do it in a responsible way. And we see working with you all as a way to do that. So thanks. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate that. Um, Ken, would love to hear from you. Thanks, Verona. It's great to be here. Um, I've got about 24 years of experience in waterfront. And um, most of that has been within the New York Harbor. And it's been pretty amazing to see the transformation in that 24 years of um, processes and approaches from early in my career until now. It's been really exciting to see um, how resiliency and adaptation have really begun to take hold. And uh, in terms of um, my own role, I focus every day on shoreline protection. So resiliency and adaptation are pretty much the core of my business. I'm doing this uh, several times a week, talking with clients about how to design shorelines and protect them for the future talking about things like resiliency, sea level rise, flood protection, what happens if you don't do that well, how to do that with uh, more natural or softer solutions than um, the old bulkhead solution or seawall solution that we saw so frequently 20 something years ago. So uh, this is something that I've been involved in every day for a very long time. And it's been really exciting to get involved in Wedge and be able to have some input in uh, future versions of Wedge, to be able to, to help train new professionals in how to do resilient design. It's been really exciting to, uh, to be a part of that. And I'm thrilled that Waterfront Alliance has really come into this space and encouraged other design professionals to really be considering uh, things like resilient design in their day-to-day -day applications, and even more so with governing agencies and clients, encouraging them to see the value in approaching things in this way. So it's been it's been really exciting. This is something I do every day. It's uh, pretty much a core of my business and our model at Lying In for how we do uh, shoreline development. So very excited to be here. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Joseph? Yeah, so as, as Farhana said, I, I lead the wedge program. So so my work is the explanation that she gave at the, the beginning of the presentation. Um, that means that for me, resilience is always at, at the top of mind alongside ecology and access, because we need to be doing those three things together. Um, what that looks like in practice is, is meeting with uh, potential projects meeting with engineers and architects and landscape architects and planners and, and regulators to talk about the importance of resilience, remind them what the risks are for a site, talk through the opportunities that they, they have to make uh, sites resilient, and then meeting with technical experts, whether they're uh, folks who are helping us update the standards or reviewers actually conducting a review on, on a project that's pursuing wedge verification and we are engaging with experts in this in this field all the time so that wedge can become a um, 
the harbor for all of the, the information that's out there on resilience that, that we can kind of put that all in, in, a, in a, a useful kind of summary for the field. Uh, because there aren't a lot of standards out there uh, that deal with, with resilience. And, and none, of the, none of the other existing standards uh, that do incorporate resilience are waterfront specific. So this really does, does fill a niche. Um, so my other roles at, at Waterfront Alliance um, are support you know, the intersections of wedge and offshore wind in the maritime industry. And then I'm also leading our work at Flushing Meadows Corona Park, where we are uh, designing um, a series of, of small and mid-scale resilience projects uh, that uh, are meant to reduce flooding in the, in the park. And that's what Congresswoman Mang's office. Really great. Thanks, Joseph. And actually, the next question goes to you again. Um, what do you think are the biggest climate hazards facing our region today? And how do you think Wedge actually addresses them? So there's there are a number of risks that are out there. And then the intensity of those risks is growing every year as a result of climate change. The big events like Hurricane Sandy and Ida, they often put those risks on kind of the public's radar, but the threat really is past. Uh, and I put the risk in a couple of different buckets. So there's, there's flooding from coastal storm surge, there is extreme precipitation, extreme heat, and then chronic tidal flooding. And also so you, we could add another bucket around air quality as we saw from the, the Canadian wildfires this summer. Um, the, these other these other threats are are things that have uh, uh, the the potential for resilient design to to help adapt to them in in New York local. So when we think about uh, the first one, flooding from coastal storm surge. So flooding is the most expensive disaster nationally. Coastal storm surge, just so that so that we're all on the same page, is the water being put inland from waterways during hurricane or other coastal storms. That threat has always existed. There, are, there have been hurricanes for um, thousands and thousands and thousands of years in, in New York, but climate change is making it worse. So we have the, the storms becoming more frequent and more intense because the water, the ocean waters are warmer. And then you have sea level rise that's raising the still water elevation so even if the storm wasn't stronger, the waves and the, the inland reach of storms are just higher because the, the baseline sea level is, is higher. And we're looking at you know, anywhere from three to six feet over the next century in, in New York City. Um, First Street Foundation, which is a, 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 a great partner and, and, and does a lot of research on um, climate threats, they did an analysis of the annualized structural damage cost from flooding um, and found that over the next 30 years, it will exceed $580 million for New York City. And that's an annualized number, not a cumulative number. And that will happen in one or two acute events. That's a staggering amount of money to hit $580 million a year. And we are second in the country in terms of the, the highest risk where we, we follow Miami after that. Um, so the part of your question is how Wedge addresses those. So and, and as we explained, Wedge is a points-based system. Different design features earn you additional points. Coastal flooding is one of the two largest credits in terms of, of point value. So we are pushing projects to elevate, to do setbacks, you know, move further from the water, do dry and wet flood proofing, landscaping protective features, creating floodable spaces where it's okay if the site floods because damage can be minimized. Um, and the scoring for wedge, the things that we're actually evaluating sites on are, what is the design flood elevation? Essentially how high of water are you protected against? Um, are you protecting neighboring sites? Are you protecting adjacent sites? Um, if you're if you're on a, a river system, are you protecting upstream and downstream sites? Um, those are some of the things that, that we're looking at. For extreme precipitation, uh, which is the other high, highest point value credit, is is focused on um, 
precipitation-based flooding or pluvial flooding. Um, if we look at New York City's stormwater system, it's designed to handle about one and three quarters inches of rain per hour in most places. I get the US seven inches in an hour. Um, the cloudburst storms that are out there, extreme rainfall events are becoming more and more common. It's really dangerous. It's a dangerous type of flooding. There were multiple deaths in New York City during um, Ida because people were, were living in basements that, that got flooded. This is a place where green infrastructure can make a, a big difference, creates a place where the, the water can go, or it delays entry into the, the stormwater system. Um, in a lot of places, if we have too much rainfall that goes into a combined sewer overflow system, that's going to put sewage into the into the harbor. Um, so green infrastructure and other types of uh, stormwater infrastructure can help reduce that that threat. Wedges similar to to in the the coastal flooding credit. Going to look at you know, what is the the storm uh, severity that you're protecting against. Do you use green infrastructure? And again, do you protect your neighbors and the adjacent sites for extreme heat, which we don't necessarily think of as an acute disaster in the same way that we do flooding, um, but it is, at least nationally, twice as deadly as hurricanes and tornadoes combined. Um, and it's worse in urban areas because of the urban heat island effect. I also heard it referred to recently as the, the urban oven effect, which I, I kind of like that term better. Um, but cities are made of materials that trap heat. It's concrete, it's asphalt, brick, it's roofing, it's a lot of dark colors. Um, so Wedge looks at how are you doing shading on the site? Are you using reflective materials? Is there, is there green scapes on the, the site? The absolute best thing you, we can do as a city is to plant trees, so that gets rewarded. Um, and then that last bucket of, of chronic tidal flooding, uh, it's sometimes that we heard you'll hear referred to as some day flooding. Sometimes it's, it's called nuisance flooding. This comes directly from sea level rise, where if our, if our mean sea level is higher, high tide is going to be higher, and there are places that cannot handle that. Um, by the, the 2070s and 2080s, there's a bunch of neighborhoods that are going to be regularly inaccessible. Even 20 years from now, there's multiple piers on the, on the Hudson that will be inaccessible. Or portions of LaGuardia Airport, parts of the, the ports facilities in Brooklyn, bunch of neighborhoods surrounding Jamaica Bay, large swaths of Flushing Creek, they're all going to see regular flooding during high tides, even in the next 20 years. So those are those are some of the threats that we're dealing with: extreme heat, chronic tidal flooding, stream precipitation, coastal storm surge. Thanks for sharing, Joseph. Um, Ken, I'm actually curious, given your background uh, and based on what Joseph has shared, um, what do you think, uh, in addition to some of the things that Joseph shared, what are some of the various solutions that can be used to build at the water's edge to prepare for these hazards? And what are some of the ways that these projects in, the, in this region have either mitigated or adapted uh, to climate risk? Sure. Um, so it's I don't deal with all of those things. I deal primarily with shoreline protection, um, rain rainfall intensity, and things along those lines. So that's that's where my responses will focus. And in terms of um, shoreline protection, there's there's a number of things that need to be considered. So Joe mentioned sea level rise. The still water level will continue to rise over time, and that's not a new phenomenon. We've known about this for hundreds of years. It's the climate change piece makes some new variables that are a bit unknown, difficult to predict. But that phenomenon is well known and well documented. It's been happening. So, you know, that, that shouldn't be new and it should not be a surprise. And having to deal with that, sure, there are some new unknowns, but having to deal with that should not be new. And so, you know, some of the common things that are done are things like raising sites, retreating, pushing your building back further so that it can be away from where flooding can happen. One of the things that uh, often comes about with, with flood are increased waves as well. So you've got these large waves plus the storm surge that are coming in at the same time. And those waves can also happen in 
day-to-day activities, things like the ferries that are passing by your site, throwing up wakes, or just a windy day can be throwing up waves as well. So how we deal with the waves, somehow I lost my video. Can you guys still hear me? We can still hear you. Great, I'll keep going. Okay. Uh, so the, the way that um, we deal with the waves um, can be really important to how we protect the site. So providing wave breaks or providing shorelines that allow waves to break before they reach sensitive structures can be really important. And that's done by using softer edges or creating a living shoreline or building a wave break, a structural wave break out in the water. Because the flood heights that you see listed on things like the flood insurance rate maps that the, the federal government publishes, they include wave heights in them. So when they report that in this coastal A zone, you've got a um, anticipated 100 year flood at elevation 13, several feet of that is wave. So if I can break those waves and reduce those wave heights, I'm automatically reducing the impact during a flood event. I'm also reducing the impact on day-to-day -day sunny type activity with wind-driven or wake-driven waves. So those sorts of things help protect our shoreline. Uh, softer features tend to absorb more of that energy from the waves and the wind and things like that. So those things respond better, whereas a bulkhead or a seawall, something that's just vertical and flat, reflects back those waves and can actually make things worse for your neighbor or worse at the toe of the wall where it can just scour away and erode that material that's holding up your wall. So those things are, are something that can be considered. Even creating vertical surfaces that are stepped back will help absorb some of that energy. So tiered systems can be helpful in uh, protecting the environment uh, from storm-based uh, damage and things like that. Uh, another thing that, that can be considered um, in general when it comes to the storm, storm protection are things like mimicking natural systems. So where we can, and, and I'm seeing this more and more, at least in the past few years, where we can create something to reduce the energy to the point that natural-based systems can survive and thrive. So maybe we have something like a, a living shoreline breakwater where marine organisms can encrust and inhabit that living shoreline, tide pools, uh, riprap, nicks and crannies that are open to them um, under the water using, using things like oyster baskets to create new reefs, reef balls, things like that, where you're, you're creating this environment where you can reduce the energy before it hits those natural things, and then creating a slowly sloped or tiered system where you have various ecological type of solutions like salt marsh or tide pool, salt marsh, uh, coastal scrub, things like that, that help number one, to continue to reduce those energies as you move further inland, but also number two, help to treat stormwater. As stormwater falls, the natural systems work fantastic where our wetlands and near wetland type environments actually filter out that stormwater before it gets to the open water body. So green type infrastructure in terms of stormwater systems that encourage infiltration and natural type of filtration um, types of systems also contribute in that shoreline development. Um, if you can't fit those sorts of things in, bioswales, the wetlands we just talked about, um, you can also do things like dry wells where you're encouraging infiltration in concentrated areas. You're, you're sure you're collecting the water to concentrated zones where it infiltrates in those dry wells. So all those sorts of solutions help both reduce the stormwater impact by reducing energies and also help reduce the stormwater runoff by encouraging infiltration and filtration through natural-based uh, natural systems. So those sorts of things are, are things that I'm excited about um, implementing and that I've seen implemented in in this region in particular. 
And as I said, I'm seeing more and more of those softer shorelines where ecology is being embedded into the shoreline systems with respecting the energies that have to be um, dealt with. I mean, that, that sort of solution is somewhat innovative still in New York, but I'm seeing it more and more frequently. And that's really where we need to head, that kind of solution. And just throwing natural, natural solutions, you know, if you just put a wetland at the East River, it's not going to be there in a year. But if we can do it smart and we're reducing those energies through engineering means combined with natural based resources and building ecologies into those systems, we can do it and they're very effective. Thanks, Ken. This is a this is super informative, and I, I really I appreciate what you're sharing here. And you know, I think, Mike, you know, one of the things that that Ken is sort of sharing is that there is there has been sort of an evolution to how some of these issues <clears throat> have been raised over the past decade and how they continue to evolve. Um, as one of the leaders, original leaders uh, behind sort of creating the wedge standard. Uh, what differences do you see today uh, compared to how you know resilience was talked about in the last ten years or so? Yeah, yeah, that's great. I've, I've been thinking about this question. It made me sort of look back and so. Mike, can you uh, can you hear us? And kudos to to Joseph and, and you know people that followed me, uh, Sarah Dorty and Kate. It's been uh, kind of heartening to me. You know, there's pressure, I think, dare I say, nice pressure on developers and anyone building at the waterfront to do the right thing. That has that has changed in a major way. I think that's a bit of, you know, societal influences and of course the good work you will all doing. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll be provocative and, and put it back to, to Joseph and Ken. You know, the things that were sort of resonating that were thorny and sort of naughty at the time were, you know, in no particular order here, definitely soft to shorelines, right? I mean, that's what, the essence of wedge was about, you know, making more uh, porosity and just getting to get away from the gray infrastructure, which I think there's uh, a mindset moving in that direction, no, no doubt. Um, the shading issue, right? The habitat uh, as relates to the DC permitting, that was an issue that came up in almost every session, workshop, panel. It was quite complex. Uh, I'm not in the weeds, so to speak now, but maybe love to hear where we are as a, as a city in that regard, or maybe state. Uh, water dependent uses, right? Like maritime friendly piers was a really big deal. There's There was a loud vocal maritime community that was um, suggesting and, and was at the table about uh, pushing, of course, to to rethink and really sort of evolve our thinking around uh, piers that, that are often for maybe um, recreational use, but really trying to sort of, you know, the chicken or the egg issue, right? Like if you build the ballers and you build all the things that a, that a vessel can, uh, can can latch onto and 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 embark from then and they will come. I don't know if we've cracked that nut again. I'd love to hear from Ken and Joe. And then you know strategic retreat, more thorny policy issues. I think you know there's a steady drumbeat and some people leading the tip of the spear in that regard. I'm not sure we've cracked the nut in that regard. And you know that's taking on I think larger forces of, of real estate that that is 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 beyond maybe all of us here. But yeah, those are just some things that come to mind. Uh, and, and I should mention the disclosure, the ESG movement, the insurance uh, community, right? We've seen the news with, uh, I think, Florida and California, the insurance community is very much, uh, the beast has been awoken. That was something we were trying to crack at the time in 2013 to get them interested in this in this uh, this journey. And and I think maybe they've come, come more in tune to sort of protecting their interests in that regard. So I'll just maybe stop there and see if, Joseph and Ken have some thoughts on some of the things I threw out there. If, if you'll bite. <laughs> well, I've already um, talked a little bit about the evolution that I've seen. Um, and I, I would say that the insurance providers have actually been a significant driver in this sort of market space. Okay. And I've seen that frequently where um, clients are coming to us saying, hey, our insurance provider wants this to protect the investment, what can we do to accomplish that? Right. And that's, that's great. But what I, I think I've also seen an ideal, um, not exclusively, but primarily in the private development sector, 
rather than public. It's not that I don't do public. I do. It's just, I would say about 80% of my work is private, private sector. And I'm seeing a push from the communities that they serve, that these development serves, uh, that desire these sorts of things as well. So it's now marketable for a developer to say, hey, I do this. I've got my wedge verification. I've you know, addressed sea level rise. I've got the softer shorelines. Uh, that's beginning to be, and, and I think that there's still room for growth there, but th that's beginning to be a market driver as well. Similar to how lead buildings uh, became a market driver. And that's good. And I, I, I can echo what Ken was saying about the, the insurance industry being a, a big driver behind this. And when we are, when, when we, over time, revise the standards. We put it in front of insurers. Uh, our technical advisory committee includes an expert on the National Flood Insurance Program because we want to make sure that the guidance that Wedge is providing is going to be aligned with things that reduce your premiums, that that align with um, FEMA flood proofing credentialing, and and um, are going to be things that are demonstrated uh, and tested to reduce the the risk of a site. And Mike, you, you brought up kind of the, the tension that exists between the maritime industry and, and community access and, and environment. I think that this is a, a, an area where Wedge uh, performs really well is its ability to, to accommodate industrial and working waterfront sites in the, the resilience and ecology and excess Context. So for, for those who aren't as, as familiar, familiar with the standard, there are credits within Wedge that are specifically adapted to um, for industrial and working waterfront sites. And the reason that, that we do that is that those sites are, are the ones that are kind of the least likely to want to build in to want to build in additional um, resilience in a lot of places or build in additional environmental benefits. They almost, almost would never have um, public access as a, as a priority. But if we can move those sites to do it, that opens up uh, a, a lot of opportunity. Yeah, I, I don't want to jump the gun, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the expectation is there that, and it, I think it behooves the developers, so to speak, developers being, you know, maybe dare I say me, in that, you know, the more we can sort of involve the community, if it's appropriate, the better, um, you know, the, the better we're going to be considered a good neighbor, right? And there's lots of synergies involving the community in proximity and, and citywide or regionwide into uh, a site um, and get people excited. And that's what we're trying to do about offshore wind. It's, it's not always uh, perfect, but Wedge is just such a great tool for, for me to use with our our team, our engineers, our internal that are energy folks, but also our consultants, and at least considering and thinking about how we might do it. Um, and usually I think it ends up being possible in some shape or form, and we're, we're gonna try to get there. This is incredibly helpful. Um, and I think just uh, this issue about insurance is incredibly important and engaging a community as well. Um, you know, I think, as we sort of talk about these hazards and these solutions, and all of you just sort of shared how much more prominent um, it is in project discussions. At the same time, uh, there are projects on the waterfront in New York City that are still not taking sea level rise into account. Um, they are not necessarily building to adequate resilient standards. I'd love to hear more about what you, you know, why is this the case? What are some of the uh, the big barriers that you see? Um, and and Ken, you know, maybe I'm hoping that you could sort of share your perspective as an engineer, sort of talking to these clients about the importance of resilience. How do they how do they usually respond? Yeah, so yeah. I think that there's a number of factors that are going on in this space of sea level rise. Um, for for one, there's the misconception that sea level rise is new that it's only about climate change, and that's not true. The climate change piece is newer, right? Um, 
But sea level rise has always been going on. This is not a new phenomenon and people ignore that or, or are ignorant of that. They just don't know any better. So that's one piece of it. I think another piece of it is they think that the law already covers this. So there's already requirements for designing for base flood elevation plus a certain code specified freeboard. Why do I need to do any more? Isn't it built into that, right? And so there's some misconception about how sea level rise affects those sorts of things and why it's not already covered in those sorts of code elements. So what's the difference between freeboard, which is meant to be kind of a factor of safety, and sea level rise, which is how that base elevation is actually going to increase. So you know th those sorts of things uh, need to be understood. So when we're talking about freeboard, we're talking about a factor of safety because of uncertainty, uncertainty in defining base flood elevation, uncertainty in defining what a hundred year storm is. There's uncertainty in those things. And as engineers, we apply factors of safety to all those sorts of things, plus many more, right? Everything is designed with some sort of safety embedded beyond what you standardly need based on uncertainties. What do we know about the loads? What do we know about the materials? How can they resist those loads? That's common practice and it's been common practice for hundreds of years. But in this one space, people don't consider that. And that freeboard really is that factor of safety because we just don't know with sufficient accuracy to say, yep, this is the number, we're gonna go with that. Sea level rise is a known factor. The, the sea will rise, period. Um, there's some political stuff going on in terms of you know, how to calculate that sea level rise, but sea level rise itself is not a political factor. It is going to happen. How much, we can argue about. But that's above and beyond your base flood, and that, that stuff needs to be considered. Beyond that, I think, so this is kind of a third factor, Third factor is that a lot of developers are looking at their site saying, I've got really limited room. There's only so much I can do on this site. So, you know, I, it would be great if I could fit this in, but I just don't have the room to do it. And to do X, Y, Z for sea level rise means I lose X square feet or X, uh, X number of floors for my building. So I think we need to overcome that. I think at least in the city of New York, Department of City Planning has been willing to have those conversations to protect that as much as possible. And uh, maybe it's not as much of a cost impact as a developer might think initially, um, but we need to have those conversations because I think there's some of that as well. So those are kind of the three factors that I think play into why there's this disconnect between um, trying to do something resilient, but not considering things like sea level rise. Thanks, Ken. Um, and, and you actually lead me into sort of thinking a little bit more about the concept of retrofits. Um, and Mike, in, in Venergy, maybe building and retrofitting port facilities. Um, do you have a sense of how easy or challenging it's been to influence, you know, the company to invest in, in resilience? Yeah. Um, well, I, so at myself and, and Sarah are on our team. So Sarah's our community engagement manager formerly at the Waterfront Alliance. So there's there's probably an expectation that we use Wedge, dare I say, and, and, we're, and we're going to, and we've signed, we've signed the commitment letter to do that. You know, the offshore wind space is super competitive, you know, like the world is watching and uh, it's this amazing opportunity to provide clean energy, but also boost uh, port infrastructure. And, you know, Invenergy is, committed to sort of doing the right thing. And, and we wanna make sure we do that in, in everything we do, including the supply chain and the various sort of things and, and be a leader in the sustainable space. So we're gonna do everything we can to meet the wedge guidelines. In New York, we are retrofitting, dare I say, or, or revitalizing a dry dock in Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is super exciting, uh, especially for someone that lives in Brooklyn and, and loves the Navy Yard. We are going to place our O&M site in, in dry dock four it won't just be a place, you know, a home port, if you will, to place our, our vessels at nighttime to service the wind farm. 
it'll be an innovation hub. Um, we'll have a marine test bed. So there's lots of um, excitement. And, and dare I say, I think that's a trend in waterfront development or just uh, sites that are, you know, in the public um, lens, you know, do, having a multi-purpose um, community driven process. And so we, we have some workforce partnerships to really sort of round out our, our equitable development there. So we're, we're super excited, but um, yeah, I was, again, I was heartened our, our team, our, especially our consultants, they, they were finishing our sentences when we were talking about wedge. And that to me was quite amazing being, you know, in the driver's seat 10 years ago um, for them to know and sort of be acclimated to that and sort of helping, helping us uh, bring our team along to sort of think about how we might um, meet the wedge guidelines. It's, it's early days for us, but we're starting to think about it now. Um, you know, I look at the McGinnis Cement uh, site as a, as a really amazing example. Sims, of course, as well. But again, the expectation is to do certain things where you can um, revitalize habitats, provide public access, obviously involve the community where you can. I think all those all those tenets and, and principles align nicely with Invenergy. And, and again, it wasn't too too hard of a sell. Costs are always uh, a factor, I think, right? Um, and so, you know, offshore wind is a great opportunity to sort of provide, provide clean energy, but it also, you know, there's there's a lot baked into the price of that power uh, for, for good. You know, there's a public benefit to, of course, to clean energy, but also uh, revitalizing supply chains and, and um, reinvigorating port infrastructure and, and our nation's long maritime heritage. There's the interconnection and transmission. So there's a lot that goes into um, uh, the offshore wind pricing, if you will. And I'm not sure everyone understands that, but the O&M site, is a part of that that process, and and wedge is a great tool to sort of get us, uh, you know, in communications internally, but also externally about how we can build the best site there that's going to serve mul multiple uh, purposes. It's great that you're having these conversations because because uh, I'm actually curious, Joseph, how do how do these kinds of conversations then sort of show up with potential clients for wedge projects? So I think it, it 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 sounds very similar to what Mike and Ken both described that that cost is a is a concern and, and the big cost in in pursuing wind just the design features that you need to pass the cost of of actually the getting the certification and uh, is is a very tiny tiny component of um, the, the project capital costs um, but things like elevating your building can be can be very expensive. Um, maintenance can be more expensive over the long term if you get a really complex design. Um, permitting can can take longer for um, some resilient project. Want, and that's something that Waterfront Alliance is is uh, figuring out how to take on. But if it, much of our uh, permitting system is is based on um, being able to rebuild in time. So if you have a, a straight bulkhead wall in the in the water right now, it's really easy to get a permit to replace that. So that creates an incentive to, to have that be what's along your waterfront. But that's just a straight concrete wall. And from everything that Ken has told us, and I see him nodding along a lot, and from everything Ken has told us, that is a very low value piece of infrastructure for a more resilient project. Waves are going to crash into that head on, go straight over the top. There's very little resilience value in that, but it's the easiest thing to get done in permitting. Um, things, things that Ken was talking about earlier uh, around ways to, to break waves and, and ways to protect um, marshlands. Those are often really hard to get through the permitting process, even though they're better ecologically and they're, they're better from a resilience perspective. Um, and that's that kind of a, a, a leftover result of all of the ecological damage that we did to the harbor in the 1800s, in the first half of, of this century with all of the, the landfill. It's, that's the, uh, the way of um, our environmental protection agencies, DEC at the state, Army Corps and others, um, trying to keep that happening from happening again, but that makes it so that anything kind of new and innovative in the, in the water can be viewed with a, um, a lot of hesitation. Um, so that's a barrier that comes up. I think one of the, I, I think tools like Wedge um, that 
create a standard around what does this look like when it's done well, um, the same way that Lee has created standards around building efficiency, that's how we put the entire field to perform better, whether it's the, the consultants and, and professionals designing the projects, whether it's the, the financiers and the, and the decision makers and developers and the regulators as well, having a clear set of standards that says, this is what we've seen work. This is what it means to, this is what success looks like. This is, these are the types of considerations you wanna build into the design. Having that standardized uh, can really help shift the field. That's what Wedge is working on. We are not at the, the level that LEED is at with hundreds of thousands of buildings across the country. Um, but the goal of Wedge is to, to reach that point where the things that we are advocating for become the norm and not the exception. I think that's great. And actually it goes into the next question that I have and would love Joseph for you to start and continue with that kind of optimism that you're sharing. Um, what, what gives you the most optimism for, for New York City in terms of climate resilience? I really think it's the enthusiasm of the architecture, engineering, construction, landscape architecture planning field. Um, the, basically what, what we see oftentimes is it's, it can be the, the folks with the checkbook who are, are, are dragging their feet a little bit, but most of the, 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 the design firms that are out there, the practitioners that are actually doing, creating the, the designs, they understand the importance uh, of building resiliently, the amount of enthusiasm and folks like Mike and Ken that actively contribute to, to Wedge, both on the, the technical side, they're reviewing projects, they're helping sell it to their, and pitch it to their clients. Like, there's a lot of enthusiasm around getting our, getting waterfront development right and doing it safely. Um, and the fact that so many people are on board with that message it gives me a lot of hope for uh, where New York City is 20, 30, 50, 100 years from now. That's great. Um, I see a lot of nods. Uh, Mike, I would love to hear from you about what you're most optimistic for. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, yeah, you have to be optimistic. There's no really time for pes pessimism. And um, I don't know, The I like the idea that it's becoming the norm. It's just at least in my sort of uh, role at, at Wedge or at Waterfront Alliance. And then 10 years later or so, it, it seems like there's people are getting it to what Joseph was saying, and I'm, I'm sure Ken would amplify that. People are just getting it, and there's there's really um, uh, a lot of focus. And I think the goal, of course, is to make sure that it's it's not separate and apart from just everyday thinking and designing and planning and, and frankly, budgeting. I think the city of New York, I saw, was looking to sort of rethink their budgeting and incorporate climate aspect into that budgeting, which I think is is uh, is, is is heartening. You know, like. The, I, I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention like youth education, there's so much focus, there was a climate march, there's there's a next generation of folks that really want to do something and there's no question if it's happening. So I'm optimistic that they will sort of continue the work that we're all doing. And, you know, my, my daughter's seven and she's asking me why we don't have an electric car <laughs> and she'll be 34 at 2050. So this is real, this is real stuff here and we sort of have to get it right. And the mitigation part that I'm working on, I think obviously will lessen the, the adaptation side of the ledger, but there's still, uh, we still have to accommodate what's gonna happen and the, and the climate is changing and that'll happen, I think, no matter what, it's just to what degree and intensity. Thanks, Mike. Um, Ken, over to you, would love to hear more about what, what you're thinking. Yeah, I've already hinted at this. Um, I'm pretty excited that I'm seeing uh, more and more developers get on board with this and begin to start a project with the goal of resiliency at the waterfront, and in particular, incorporating ecology access and resi resiliency from the start with their dollars at the shoreline. Um, I'm seeing that more and more frequently. It's becoming um, more frequent in the requests that we get from clients. And that really excites me because it means the norm is shifting and it really does need to shift. So that, that I would say is probably the most exciting piece. I see 
the shift beginning to happen. Thank you, Ken. Um, unfortunately, Joseph just uh, just stepped away from his internet for a second. Um, we will be back on. The internet stepped away from me. You should be able to hear me in a minute. Um, so Joseph, actually, just the last question, and hopefully you can hear him. Um, what is next for, for Wedge? Wedge has Wedge version 3.0 that will come out on October 23rd. This is about a, a year and a half in the, in the making. Uh, the last update to the standard was back in 2019. Um, Wedge version 3.0 is bringing in inland waterways. Um, to deal with you know, the unique flood dynamics and ecosystems that happen in rivers and lakes and the Great Lakes. Um, we're going to have a couple of launch events for people to be able to learn about that update to the standard coming up on October 23rd, uh, where we'll have a, a webinar. And then for folks in New York on the 24th, um, over at Chelsea Piers, we'll have a, a live session. Um, I think there will be links to those dropped in the chat if they're not there already. Um, but that's going to be the, uh, a great way to learn about the new standard for Wedge Associates, folks who have taken the Wedge Professionals course. Um, you can extend your Wedge credential, your Wedge Associate credential through those, uh, but they're also open for anyone who wants to learn about the, the new standard. Um, we are really excited that that's, that's being released. Uh, it makes it a truly nationally applicable standard, uh, taking us beyond just, uh, just coastal waterways. So that's what's next. Congratulations, that's amazing. Um, with that, so there are a few questions in the Q and A, uh, and and I'd love to be able to go to uh, those questions in the remaining time that we have. Um, I will just uh, I'll pull them up very quickly. Uh, the first question is: uh, You are all sharing some great insights and advice that other places globally can use to enhance their infrastructure in handling coastal problems. Uh, technology can be used not only, technology can be used to not only share, but also improve outcomes for these situations. Beyond creating a standard, are you working with organizations to share these best practices with the world to scale adoption? Um, yes. Uh, we definitely are. So and it, it goes both ways. So there's a lot of Dutch influence in the way that um, we talk about coastal flooding and um, flood risks. So we've, we've been learning from elsewhere. Waterfront Alliance is a member of ARISE, which is a, a UN connected um, coalition around um, climate hazard reduction. Um, and then we have the Wedge Professionals course uh, which is accessible to everyone. It's an on-demand self-paced course at wedgeprofessionals.org. We have people who have taken that course in Canada, Spain, Singapore, um, countries all over the world. Um, so we're, we're always excited when people outside of the U.S. Um, pick up Red Wedge and, and run with it. Um, I think there's, there's lots of opportunity there. Um, Mike or Ken, did you also want to add any other sort of color to that question? Okay, sounds good. Um, the next question is, uh, what are the panel's thoughts on uh, the U.S. Army Corps, New York, New Jersey HATS project? Ken, Mike, Joseph. Either one of you can take. Yeah, I guess I'll start. Um, you know, from just putting this in perspective, it's a first broad brush. It will never go into effect that way. So I think people need to understand that from the start. Army Corps is soliciting comments. They want to know what the public thinks. And I can't see that uh, in a city like New York, a giant wall along the entire coast of uh, New York is really going to be well received. Um, from a resiliency standpoint, uh, that's certainly not the best solution. There are other solutions that would better serve our community and better protect our shorelines. So, you know, just creating a wall, as we've talked about before, uh, that's not going to get us the best resiliency um, that we're looking for. I will take the the easy answer and defer to colleagues. So Wednesday's Waterfront Alliance um, 
Climate Week webinar. Um, it, it will we'll spend a lot of time talking about uh, the HATS project um, with our um, senior manager for climate policy, Tyler Taba, uh, who's been leading um, engagement with HATS uh, internally here at Waterfront Alliance. It's Wednesday at noon. Um, highly recommend that because they'll they'll focus on that quite a bit. Great, thank you. Um, I think we can take one more question and then we can wrap up. Uh, what best practices are there in making sure buildings beside the water are resilient? I, I, I think that um, with any site and every waterfront site is unique. Um, I think it's, it's a combination of practices. It's a combination of setting further back away from waves, doing wet and dry flood proofing, elevation changes, breaking the waves. Um, there, there's a number of different, uh, of different ways to reduce risk and no single right solution. Um, and I think that when, when you look at um, neighborhoods where there has been a lot of development, you'll see that you know, one building next to another, they, they've taken different approaches. Um, and that, that type of, or that lack of uniformity is actually okay. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, totally agree with what Joe said. It's really a combination of things, and generally you want to use a combination of things rather than just one approach. I think early on, the default answer was, oh, we'll just dry flood proof the building. And I want to make a point that dry flood proofing a building is probably the least effective of all of the tools in your toolbox, because if you miss one thing, just one thing, the entire system fails. So better to do that combined approach to consider your, your siting and your shoreline and uh, come up with a number of tools that'll help you address that. Well, thank you, Joseph, Mike, Ken. Uh, really appreciate you being here and for these fantastic insights and for helping to shine a light on key issues related to climate resilience and adaptation. Um, I also want to thank our audience for being here uh, and engaging in this extremely important conversation in the wake of the current climate crisis. Um, we hope that you'll attend the rest of our Climate Week webinars and events uh, and learn more about what the work um, that Waterfront Alliance is doing uh, to prepare our communities for this changing climate. Um, thank you all and, uh, and have a wonderful Climate Week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care.